Amen. Come on, one more. Let's give the Lord a hand. Praise. One name. I, I love that song because of so much truth that is brought in it. No other name under heaven and earth shall man be saved but by the name of Jesus. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess whether you accept him or not there will come a day that every knee shall bow and declare Jesus Lord. Amen. If you can get that part right, come on, you're halfway through. If you can get Jesus' part right, amen. Amen. Come on, one more time. Let's give the Lord a hand praise. Stand on your feet just one moment. Get your last stretch before this hour. <laughs> amen. So good to see so many of you. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise for our praise team. Wonderful, wonderful job. Thank you, guys. So, Father, once again, in the name of Jesus, we come to you and we ask that you would declare, Lord God, your word. That you would speak to our minds, to our hearts, to our circumstances and situations. That you would speak and prophesy to our future. That you would declare our eternity, destiny. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. That you would declare yourself Lord today. Hallelujah. And that the enemy today will be brought down low. That lies will be revealed. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, Lord. In the blessed name of Jesus. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory for what is yours and yours alone. In Jesus name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Come on. You may give the Lord a hand praise. Amen. Amen. I'm going to attempt to stand today, but I brought my chair. I have a little foot problems. I said I'm not going to mention it anymore, but I'm trying not to sit down. But so if I have to turn around and pick this chair up, you know that something happened. Amen. Worship in the wilderness. Chapter th part three. Turn and open your Bibles to Exodus. Chapter 25, verses 8 to 9. This is a series we've been on, and, and um, we've been having a lot of fun with it. Some people have been challenged. But there is a, a revelation, or excuse me, I should say a, yes, a revelation that we must recognize of the similarities between the tabernacle of Moses and the church. There are some simulations between Israel and the church that are undeniable. And if you are a Bible student, if you are a Christian, these are things you should know. And it's sad to say that these things have not really been taught. Um, I think one of the reasons it hasn't been taught is because it's, it's a complicated. It, in other words, you have to spend time in the word to get the essence of it. But it is a physical representation of Israel. Let me say that again. I'm going to really try to take my time because we're all in different places. Some of us have been studying scripture for a long time. Some people are new. So you just kind of have to take your time. Some have read the Old Testament. Some haven't. But it is a, a physical representation of Israel, the tabernacle in the wilderness, of a spiritual reality of the church. You and I, the chosen people, the 
the special people, God's chosen generation. And the, 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 the simulations are amazing. And if you read, take the time to read the Old Testament or the, the exodus of Israel out of Egypt, you will see the similarities that we have in our life as the church. And it will explain so much to you. Exodus chapter 25 says it like this. Verse 8 and 9. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the furniture just as you shall make it. God is literally giving instructions. Now, for those of you that don't know, Israel was enslaved by Egypt. And Israel finally cried out to God because of what they were going through. And God brought up a man by the name of Moses. And I, you know my joke, 80-year-old man with a stick. I said, God didn't need an army. God called. I love, I love how God does. God, God, do, you know, all the stuff we think we need to get God to do something. God will take the, the least, hallelujah, likeliest, hallelujah, oh, hallelujah, to show his power and his authority and how just how bad and how awesome he is. And so he sends Moses, and Moses goes down to Egypt and brings the children of Israel when he faces Pharaoh and all of their idolatry in the land, and he brings them up out of Egypt, cross the Red Sea, and he brings them into the wilderness. Now, Israel represents the church. It's not the church, but it's a type and a shadow of things to come. Egypt represents the world. Who do you think Pharaoh represents? The devil. So when you read the Old Testament, God's giving us a picture of, listen, a physical outside picture hallelujah, of how a spiritual reality takes place hallelujah, with the church. Who do you, where do you think God brought the church out of? Out of the world, from up under Satan. And Moses represents who? Christ. He's not the Christ, but he's a type and a shadow of the Christ to come. And he goes down with a stick because the stick represents a shepherd. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And so Israel are God's people under the law. You guys say, you with me? And then the church are God's people under grace. And so God had to bring them out of bondage, out of slavery, into the wilderness to give them the law and introduce himself to them. I am your God who brought you out of Egypt. You would have thought they called on him. You would have thought they knew him. Oh, it's a lot of folks. We heard about you. <laughs> what, what did Job say? He said, I, I heard about you. Hallelujah. Well, hallelujah. I, 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 believe, I thought I believed in you. I, I thought I knew you. But now, after you've gone through all the trials and the tribulations of, of his wilderness, he says, now I know you. After you brought me out of sickness, after you brought me out of my loss of losing my children and all my wealth, hallelujah, now, God, you've restored me and brought me back in my right mind. Now I, I know you. I thought I knew you. Oh, it's a whole lot of folks that think they know God. Israel was enslaved, oppressed by two masters, Pharaoh and Egypt. One representing Satan, the other representing the world. 
When God saved you, what were you oppressed over? Who were your two enemies? First Peter puts it like this. Chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. I like to give you an address so you can't lie on me. <laughs> you know, in these days, you got to give an address. You know, pastor, you said, oh, no, let's go back and play the tape. First Peter, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Who are we talking about? The church. He says his own special people. You know, some of us suffer from low self-esteem. I have no idea why. Let me, let me read it to you again. Let me tell you who you are. Let me tell you who you belong to. Let me tell you who's got his hand on you and got a plan for you. Hallelujah. I'm talking about Jesus. Hallelujah. Woo, Jesus. <clears throat> but you are a chosen generation. God chose you. A royal priest who brought you into royalty. A holy nation separated you from the, the sins of the world and made you holy. Listen to what he says. His own special people that proclaim the praise. Do you wonder why we sing? When you don't get caught up in the song, come on. You're not proclaiming, you're not proclaiming the praise. Come on. So you're going to let somebody else want to give your praise after he didn't brought you out? After he didn't took care of you, you're going to let somebody else get your praise? Huh. Y'all better be glad my foot was hurting this morning because I was getting ready. I, I was over there. I say, no, man, come on, calm down. But I was ready. Oh, I'm going to surprise you one day. Pastor Carolyn, no. That proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness. God opened your eyes. Man, when our eyes got opened, I said, Lord, this was here all the time. <laughs> it's amazing when somebody walk in and you turn the lights on, something you can't find. You don't know where you are in the room. Somebody turns and just everything becomes so clear. Life became clear for me when God opened my eyes. I was so depressed, tried to commit suicide. Everything I thought life was about, I found out had nothing to do with life. Why do you think I was doing drugs? Because I was trying to escape a reality of a life that I did not uh, 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 love or want. Hallelujah. I didn't think my life turned out the way I wanted it. So what do you do? Drug addicts drown themselves. Alcoholics drown themselves because they are not happy with their present circumstance and situation. They are trying to escape a reality. And so they have to stay high, hallelujah, and in a state of mind, hallelujah, oh, hallelujah. But when God comes along and touches you and gives you the joy, all of a sudden you don't need a drink. Come on, you don't need any drugs. You don't need to party. It's so much stuff, come on, that you don't need anymore because God gives you something, come on, that you know. He gives you a joy and a peace that this world cannot give you. Called you out of darkness into his, and I love it. Then he just doesn't say light. He says marvelous. <laughs> Look at mother. Mother said, oh. mother just, I know what you're talking about. That's what mother said. Come on. <laughs> Come on. You should want to want some of this, Jesus. A marvelous light. I don't know if I had any of that marvelous. I mean, come on. I understand light, but I don't know if I had some marvelous light. Give me some of that. Let me find out what that Greek word is for. Marvelous light. Come on, let me taste some of that. Can I just, can I just be me? Okay, I'm going to talk a little country. It's okay, but I'm just being me. He goes on and he says, who once were not a people. I love this. He points the fact out that we weren't always the church. We weren't always saved. You didn't always know Jesus. You weren't always living holy. You didn't always do it right. You were lost. You were blind. You didn't know God. You were in bondage. You were in sin, just like everybody else. It tickles me when folks get so self-righteous. 
I, I just, it tickles me. So anyways, you, so he goes on, one lot of people, but now you are the people of God. Listen to this, who have obtained mercy. And now you are the people of God. Amen. So the world represents Egypt. Satan represents Pharaoh. And the bondage that they were in represents the, the spiritual slavery of sin. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Still on the same subject about being called out. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, and whence, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. What is he talking about? The course of this world. He's talking about the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The world, the reason we have issues in politics and we have issues with races and culture is because of what people see that they want. That the lust that we have and the desires that we have within our own flesh and the pride of life. Everybody wants to have power and control. And that's how the world operates. It operates. And so people that are in charge want to continue to stay in charge. And they're willing to do lie, cheat, and steal to do anything to what? To stay in charge. And people are falling into that, that battle. And God calls you out of that. God doesn't want you to have to what? Have that battle. He goes on. He says, according to the prince and the power of the air. Who's the prince and the power of the air? The spirit who works in the sons of disobedience. Listen to this, verse 3. Among whom you also were all once conducting yourself. Again, he goes back. Here's Paul talking. He says, you used to do that. You used to conduct yourself in the lust of the flesh. Listen to this. The, for, the lust of the flesh, the fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of your mind. I love that he brings our desires into the picture. And you were by nature children of wrath. In other words, you were an enemy of God and did not even know it. And so Israel, again, they cried out to God. Just like we cried out to God. And God sent Jesus. The Old Testament looks back. The Old Testament looks forward to the cross. The New Testament looks back to the cross. Even Israel was always looking for a savior. So they get to the wilderness. Now, in the past, we have been told that the wilderness is a bad place to be. I think innately, we just, when we hear wilderness, we want to believe it's a bad place. It's not for me. It's not something that I want. And we want to get out of the wilderness as soon as possible. We think it's a bad place. But our perspective of the wilderness being a bad place is not God's perspective of the wilderness being a bad place. God, in his finite wisdom, fixed, predestinated his purpose for the wilderness. You have a perception of what the wilderness should be. God has a plan of what the wilderness is. Before you were born, finite meaning it was fixed, predestinated meaning it was already put in place. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And so when you came along, come on, you came along with your opinion and your thoughts, and God says, I already got this in place. Hallelujah. What we don't realize about God is God God's already has everything in place. The problem is, is we don't want to get with God. Now, 
So God has a purpose for the wilderness. He brings us into the wilderness to be tested. When we're tested, it shows us where we are. He brings us into the wilderness to develop us. He doesn't want to just test you. He's not, he's not trying to down you or make you feel bad because you find out where you are. Listen, I can't bring you to the next place if I don't show you where you are. When, when they give you a test, the whole purpose of a test is not to, oh, hallelujah, it's not to degrade you or demean you. It's to show you what you're missing. Hallelujah. So a good teacher will give you a test, find out what you're missing, and then give you the tools and the things that you need so that you could graduate or pass the class or the test. Come on, you should be glad I'm in, you're in the wilderness. You should be happy you're in the wilderness. God's trying to show you something. God's trying to bring you across, come on, the wilderness so he can lead you into the promised land. God's predetermined destination for you is his promise. Hallelujah. But sometimes we want to wander. <laughs> what you doing? I'm wandering. Pray for me. How you doing? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. But you wandering. You don't want to learn. You don't want to learn the lesson so you can get to. Come on. Who do we say you were? You're a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Hallelujah. You don't want to get to the place. Come on. Where God desires you to be. The wilderness is good. Nothing wrong with the wilderness. The wilderness is your friend. Hold on. You're not by yourself. Now, if you was by yourself, I would say run. <laughs> but if God is with you, learn the lesson. What is he trying to teach you? God, you have me here for a reason. The wilderness is there to help develop you and guide you. We're going to talk about the tabernacle <clears throat> in just a minute. It's a place where you learn to worship and get to know him. I did not know who God was. Wow. I would have never known who God was until I fell. <laughs> we were in church for years. I was singing in the choir. I didn't know God. But until I came to the end of myself, and until all the hurt and the pain came about, until I had no place else to turn, did I find out who he was? And I, I say this all the time. It's as if God was waiting for me to finally fall to where I finally couldn't look to anyone else or anything else and finally said, God, if you don't save me, this is how I'm going to die. Hallelujah. And he says, son, I've been waiting on you. Now, let's get up. And he brought me to the wilderness of no distractions. Turn off the TV. Stop reading the newspaper. Come here. Get in this quiet place with me. Read my word. Learn my name. Feel my presence. Let me, let me give you some of my peace. Over and over, it's going to be all right, son. I got you. Matter of fact, I've been watching over you all these years. When you were in that drug house, I was there. Hallelujah. When you, when you had that gun to your head, some of us know. Come on. I was there. When you thought you were going to kill yourself, I was there. When nobody, this, when you thought nobody loved you, I was there. Oh, I got some witnesses in the house. I'm by myself. Anybody know Jesus? Anybody know the Lord? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Even Jesus had to go to the wilderness. He's our leader. He's our example. God didn't just send him in the ministry. He was the son of God. He could have just gave him a temple and said, son, go in there and preach and let the people come in. No, he didn't. He sent them to the wilderness. Why? So that he could become 
the Savior. Listen, listen to this. Listen to this. Listen to this. Luke chapter 4. Hallelujah. Verse 1. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Ghost, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. You thought you were the only one in the wilderness. Jesus, hold on. Israel and God, come on, through the wilderness. Jesus then went through the wilderness. Now, why are you crying? Come on, the wilderness is the way. Come on, somebody. The wilderness, the only way you're going to get to the promise is through the wilderness. There's no, no, you, you don't get to go around. You don't get to find another door. Come on, you've got to go through the same path and same door everybody else goes through. Jesus had to be tested to be the perfect sacrifice. If he would have sinned and felt the test in the wilderness, me and you would not have the salvation in the name of Jesus. He had to be tested to become the Messiah. He had to be tested to become the, the priest and the interceder. Right now, Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father, interceding for both you and I. Hallelujah. When you mess up and don't get it right, Jesus says, Father, I got him. Hallelujah. Come on. When father wants to come on, you got to understand that the father told Moses, I'm going to destroy them and give you a new people because they're not acting right. Moses stood in the middle of it and said, but God, if you kill them, they're going to talk about what you've done and how you brought them out. And then you killed them in the wilderness. He was interceding. He was the priest. He was the type of Christ. Christ has been interceding on your behalf from the first time you sinned. Jesus has been sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding for you. Hallelujah. And you didn't even know him. You're in that bad relationship. He was interceding. He's the head of the church. He's the counselor. He had to pass the test to become the head. Folks want to become a folks want positions in the church. <laughs> what wilderness do you want to go through? You're passing out positions. First thing happened. Now you want to leave. <laughs> he was the Example, he was the lily in the valley. He had to press the test. That's why they call him the bright morning star. He's the only begotten son. He had to become the son of man, but he had to go through the wilderness to pass the test. Listen to this. And when he got in the wilderness, he only gave us three examples. Oh, this is so good. A lot of people miss this. They only give us three examples of the test that Jesus took in the wilderness. You guys know them. And the devil said to him, if you're the son of God, command a stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written. Sometimes we never get past the idea that it is written. We, we stay stuck. But listen to what he says. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. What was he saying? He was worshiping the Father. He started worshiping. Worship in the wilderness. He's showing us how every time the enemy came at him, he worshiped. He said it is written, and he and it's it. You shall not live by every word, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That is reverence. That is worship. That is him pointing the way to the Father. But him saying he's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God that will provide. Here's the way. He started worshiping God. Second test. Then the devil took him up on a high mountain, showing him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment's time. And, and the devil said unto him, all this authority I will give to you. Do you notice that? You see, who's, who's in charge? The devil says, I'm in charge of the world. He says, all oh, this authority I will give to you, and they'll glorify all of its glory and deliver it to me, and I will give it to whoever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, I will give all of this to you. You know what Jesus said? Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and only him shall you serve. That answers the first commandment. There shall be what? No other God before me. The greatest, I, I believe that the, 
greatest sin of all is idolatry. That, be, that which you worship or put before God. That's the greatest sin. Because if you, can, if you can get over that sin, come on, all the others will fall in line. See, we're so focused and we want to get detailed about all the other sins. And, and then we want to grade the sins. Well, you know, I, at least I didn't, you know, at least I didn't murder anybody. But everybody knows you don't tell the truth. I'm just saying you can't grade sins. Third one. But how did, how did he worship God? He, he says it. You shall what? You shall worship the Lord your God. What was his answer? Worship. Third one. And then he brought him into Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For what is written, you shall what? The devil gives him the word. For you shall give angels charge over you and to keep you. And in their hand you shall what? Bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered, it has been said, you shall not what? Tempt the Lord your God. Every answer God gave was simply that of worshiping God. He didn't try to figure it out. He didn't try to answer it. He just wanted to talk about what is written, but what was written pointed to the authority and the power of who God is. What are we talking about? Still talking about worship in the wilderness. Listen, listen. And so Jesus passed the test. The Bible tells us, listen to this, and he returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Are you following this? He's sent into the wilderness to be tested of who he shall become. When he passes the test, God brings him out of the wilderness, but now he comes out with power and authority. Sometimes we go, and the reason we don't have the power authority that we need over the enemy is because we never passed the test. Listen to it. Listen to, listen to what the word of God said. It said, and Jesus returned in the power of the spirit to Galilee. Listen to this. Listen to this. Now, think about this. Jesus was born of the spirit. He was born of a virgin, born of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says when he was 12, he did what? He grew in the spirit. Then the Bible goes on. When he was baptized, he was baptized by the spirit. Then he came out of the wilderness in the power and the authority, what? Of the spirit so that he could fulfill the purpose and the destiny hallelujah, oh, hallelujah, of his being. And it all happened where? And he didn't get his graduating or his marching what, papers until he went through what? The wilderness. And when he gets out of the wilderness and he comes out in the power of the, of the spirit and the authority of it, the Bible says he goes to the synagogue on a, sab a Sabbath day. And it's Luke chapter 18 and Jesus gets up and he finds the place where it's written in the book of Isaiah and he reads the spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach gospel to the poor. And he declares his purpose. He declares his destiny. He declares his authority. He declares his power. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, the devil is mad up in here. Hallelujah. Oh, so much truth and revelation is coming out. Uh, somebody might scream. Just put your hand on him and say, in the name of Jesus, calm down. That devil's mad. Listen, listen, listen. And he goes on. Listen. And he says what? And he just sent me to heal the brokenhearted. This is what I love about God. God's trying to help you, not hurt you. God wants the best for you. He wants to heal you. God wants his best for you. He sent his son, sent them through hell. Come on, to give you heaven. Yeah. Hallelujah. Sent them through pain and, and suffering and rejection so that you could have acceptance. Hallelujah. So that you could have peace and joy. Hallelujah. 
Well, hallelujah. To proclaim liberty to the captive. To recover the sight of the blind. To set up liberty to those who are oppressed. And then to proclaim the acceptable year of the, of the Lord. Hallelujah. Meaning that salvation is today. And you don't have to wait until tomorrow. Salvation is now. Salvation is near as your mouth and your heart. Salvation is now. You're in the dispensation of grace. Grace is for you today. Mercy is for you today. Healing is for you today. Right now. This moment, this day, this hour, this minute, this second, not tomorrow. Well, I'm gonna wait till I get it together. No, no, no. You don't have. You don't know if you have the grace to wait. You may not return. So our perception of the wilderness is wrong. Our perception of the wilderness is, is worldly and carnal. Our perception of the wilderness is self-centered. Ready to please the flesh and not God. So God tells them, Make me a sanctuary. Make me a dwelling place that I can come and, and live among you. And then I'm going to give you the blueprint on how to do it. Because um, I'm just not going to reside in any kind of temple. I'm God. The creator. The maker of heaven and earth. And I'm holy. I don't do dirt. I need something clean that represents who I am. I'm a king. And so he gives that to them. Listen to this. A holy dwelling place, a home and a habitation. And he sits it in the center of Israel. All 12 tribes were planted around the tabernacle so that God would be the center of their lives. Here's the problem with the church. Jesus is the head of the church. The pastor is the under shepherd. Every soul within the church, Jesus should be the head and the center of why we even come. If your mouth is on the pastor or sister so-and-so or deacon so-and-so, you've missed the boat. It's not about the pastor, sister, son. It's about gee, the one who died for you. The one who paid the price for you. If you can't come for him, you're coming for all the wrong reasons. Jesus, hallelujah. Hallelujah, the tabernacle, God himself. The reason why we should even come is because we come to worship and praise and honor the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first, the last, the lily in the valley. Hallelujah. We come for him and him alone. That's why we should come. And then whatever we do should be for him. Why? Because he's supposed to be the center. And this is what I love about God. God builds a tabernacle in such a way that God says, okay, here's my pattern. Here's my directions. Listen to this. And now this is how you are to approach me. You just can't approach me any old kind of way. Outer court. Inner court. Most holies of holies. The most holy of holy is where he resides. But if you want to get to him, you got to go through the outer court. What is the outer court and what does it represent? You see that fire? That fire is where they put the sacrifice. 
You see those animals in that table? That table is where they kill the sacrifice. That's where the blood. You see those guys in those white suits? Those are the priests. Those are the servants of the Lord. And they receive your offering, your what your sin offering. And they were to take the, the animal and put him on the table and then slay him. And when they got finished slaying him, cutting him up, they would put him on the fire. And then as they put the animal on the fire, the smoke would rise to God. Oh, hallelujah. And God says, okay, now you're ready for the next step. But here, this is what people don't understand. And, and here's the other thing, too. You were supposed to lay your hands upon the offering be- while the priest was killing him so that your sins were transferred to the offering. Oh, I wish I had time. Oh, I wish I had time. See, most people don't get to know God because you don't let God deal with your sins. Hallelujah. See, the animal, How you got to understand that the animal was sitting there. Hallelujah. And now you got to put your hands, would represent you dealing with your sins. And now you're confessing as the, as the animal dies, you're confessing your sins. Can you imagine? This is a pet that you groomed. And now he has to pay a price for your sin. This is the Jesus, come on, that, that come on, you knew his name in vain. Because you just can't approach God. You can't get to the holy place if you haven't gotten to the first place. And hold on. And then you giving your sin, you allowing God to deal with your sin, that's worship. So Israel was wandering in the wilderness because they could never get the outer court right. You can go through the motions. You can come to church and sit and you can go through the motions. (laughs) But God knows your heart. God knows. You've got to let God deal with your sins. I called on God when I was on those drugs. I was praying. Nobody knew, but I was praying. I hate this. But you know what I kept talking about? Listen, don't miss this. I kept talking about the drug, but not my sin. I kept talking to God about what I hated, but not what I needed to deal with. I, I, I was in denial, and God was just sitting there waiting for me to finally. And you know what my prayer of salvation was? Nobody prayed with me. I said, Lord, if you don't. Do something, I'm going to die like this. And the the thought came, I've hurt a lot of people. And I said, Lord, forgive me for all the people that I've hurt. Then another thought came. And God, I've sinned against you. Mother, hallelujah. Something happened. Hallelujah. I can't explain it to you. Hallelujah. But when I got finished telling God how I've sinned and this and how my heart was sorry that I'd sinned against this holy God. Hallelujah. Something happened to me. Something happened inside of me. To this day, I'm still talking about it. It's been 30 years. Come on. God met me in a place. God met me. And it was this, I've been waiting for you. Listen, to get to this place. What place? The outer court. Been waiting for you. I got to the outer court. Then I went to the inner court. Inner court. You see the inner court? The snow bread, it represents the word of God. All of a sudden, the word of God. And I used to pick up the Bible all the time, but it wouldn't speak to me. After I had to deal with the, the outer court, all of a sudden the word of God started making sense. God started speaking to me. The words were lifting up off the page. I heard a voice. Stuff started making sense. You see the you see the, the lighting? That's the represents the Holy Spirit. I didn't know it at the time, but the Holy Spirit was now living inside of me. He wasn't just on the outside. Now he was living on the inside. And I could hear his voice and he was comforting me. 
And I knew that I, and you see the, the other little instrument right there in the back is the, what they call the, the incense, the prayer of incense. And all of a sudden, listen, now my prayers seem like they were getting through. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. All of a sudden, come on, I could pray and I knew God could hear me and stuff started happening. God started answering my prayers. Hallelujah. All of a sudden, come on, I start telling people about this Jesus that I've met. That all these years I've been in a church. 14 years I was singing in the choir. 14 years and I didn't know him. I'd be speaking 10 of a, a, Let me see. Woo! Woo! It gets good to you. Oh, God, Jesus. Okay, Lord, that's, that, that's, that's, my, that's my cue. Shut up. That's my cue when I can't get it out. But the path to knowing God just showed you the path to knowing him. Do you know the, the other places where the Ark of the Covenant is? We'll get there next week or week after. But that's the path. I love it. It is a fixed, determined path and wisdom of God. The path, Man, if you get this. If you can get this concept, your faith will never suffer lost. God gave us a picture of how he works. And we have to come to that outer court because we mess up. We have to come to that outer court over and over again. Here's the thing. Jesus died once. Got to worry about it. We got to worry about it again. He died once and for all. But we can boldly come to the throne of grace in a time of need. Hmm. I didn't sit down once. Boy, if I tell you. <laughs> I know, I know. We know exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to get home and it's going to be, that foot going to be hurting. Say, oh, speak life, huh? Amen. Hmm. You guys, I want to say this. We're living in a time, of, I'll close with this. We're living in a time where you really have to make up your mind if you're going to live for Jesus. Darkness is everywhere, and, it, and it's real, and people are falling for it, and you need to be on, you need to know who he is, and there's some dark times coming. I hate to be, I hate to sound like doom and gloom, but if you can't see that, there's some darker times coming, but here's the thing I love about our God. He can lead you through the darkness. And you got to learn how to be with him in the wilderness. He wants you to learn that so that when the dark times come, come on, you don't have any problem following him. So, Father, we give you praise. We give you glory and honor. Thank you for your, your lesson and your word today. We pray that it falls on good ground. And we pray, oh God, that your purpose and your destiny for this community of believers, individually and collectively, will fulfill our purpose and destiny for you, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand praise. <laughs>